couple. Yeah, my goal is to finish those today and uh, basically transition over to a uh, more recognized uh, lecture format. Um, last time we've been going through uh, the final two and, and specifically we, had, um, we dove into the testing side, sort of risk driven testing. And I want to finish up that discussion before going on and talk about another key component associated with quality insurance, which is peer reviews. Um, so those are my major goals for today as far as uh, coverage is concerned. Um, okay, so uh, we had started to talk about the role of risk review testing. Um, I made it clear some of the items that were expected of you. Um, and I'm going to expand on some of these a little bit more, particularly uh, in as much as it gets into the DevOps side. Did you folks talk about DevOps in your in your 370 or 270 or or 470 classes for those who've taken 470? Is, is DevOps and DevOps principles something you've discussed before? Okay, um, you should be aware of that because it's in pretty much industry wide. Um, set of, um, of principles and ideas and organizational commitments that's actually uh, achieved a great deal of prominence within the past decade, certainly in past five years, particularly. Um, and it combines together elements of, uh, on the technical side, sort of software development, um, uh, software engineering, on the one hand with, uh, with institutional commitments and uh, IT operations. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about it um, since you haven't been familiar with it. So we talked about different levels of testing that are expected of you. And I, I didn't really emphasize it, but it bears noting that, you know, this is called the B model of testing sometimes. And these tests here are sort of paired with corresponding levels of design here, um, where, uh, you know, Low level design is captured by unit tests. Requirements in the very highest level, sort of design documents, as it were, are, are tested by acceptance tests. And you have these other levels, roughly speaking, being tested by things. The thing I really want you to know here and recognize, um, I should be sure that, uh, I want to be sure that the recording's on, yeah, is that uh, we have. Uh, and I'm going to switch over to my, my screen here again, um, uh, is that we have this, um, this use of, um, sorry, we're, I'm having trouble uh, sharing this, uh, starting this up again. Somehow it's in presentation mode or something. Uh, not sure what's, what's going on. Um, so here we, okay, mumble. Um, Hey, come on. There we go. Um, so we, we have this different levels of tests. And the different levels of tests test um, kind of at different levels of abstraction. So unit tests at the most basic level, testing classes of functions. Integration tests, testing how different functions work together or different classes cooperate. You're basically, you may have confidence about each of the pieces, but if the pieces don't play together nicely, if they don't have compatible protocols or, or, or expectations, you know, each of them might be right in isolation, might match some specification, but there's some inconsistencies in the specification. Maybe one returns zero to indicate failure and one to indicate success and the other uses those in a, in a different way, right? Uh, it, it, it indicates it takes zero is indicating success and one is failure or what have you. And, and so you need integration tests to make sure they play together nicely. And most of our code depends on other code, right? Um, it depends on other code to work properly. And uh, if we just test each piece, um, sometimes uh, you know, you're not sure how to isolate things to that piece. And this is where mocking comes into, uh, comes into play. But uh, so unit tests, we often use mocking to, or stubbing or, or faking to, to kind of um, 
limit the impacts of, of other pieces of the system. Whereas an integration test, the whole goal is to test things working together. Okay. And you're testing sort of sub areas of the code that are tightly coherent, that use each other uh, closely. Um, system tests, as I emphasized, uh, focus often on, on user end-to-end user -end tests, et cetera. And acceptance tests here, um, uh, really on, on making sure the requirements are achieved, okay? In certain industries, acceptance tests are a really very central part of operations. Uh, in tightly regulated industries like the pharmaceutical industry, acceptance tests have a whole set of uh, regulations involving them. Uh, for example, they might bring in outside testing companies that have that have an arm's length relationship to verify that the system is working properly so that they can certify that the system meets requirements of the regulators or something like that. You can have a certification by a third party. And so acceptance tests uh, have a, a, a sort of life of their own in some uh, industries and some sub industries. Um, and I gave some suggestions. Um, this one on the lower right, um, the use of DevOps practices. Um, uh, and I don't think this was actually in the version of the slide you saw uh, last time, I'll, I'll, I'll update it. But um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that more uh, today. Uh, okay, so I had some suggestions along these lines. Uh, some of these uh, get into issues with, with DevOps quite seriously. So the first is you wanna plan for a standardized testing. What do I mean by that? Um, anyone? What do I mean by a standardized test environment? It's a lot of fancy terms. What do I really mean? What's this whole thing about standardization? Yeah, Lee. Do you want, yeah. do you, do you want kind of a consistent um, environment for all the versions of things that are going to be interesting? You have all those things all there. Yeah. Totally. Um, this may sound like a minor point, um, but it actually turns out to be a major headache if you don't pay attention to it. It ends up occupying a lot of your time dealing, you know, chasing, chasing problems that are not really defects with the code, but are just due to vagaries of what this person had installed. Um, uh, and it goes into the fact that these days software, modern software often depends on many, many libraries, many, many other systems. It's counting on the operating system and libraries of various levels, sometimes, you know, uh, things uh, like DLLs, dynamically loaded libraries and Windows or corresponding things and Linux, Mac, etc. And if you don't have those standardized, um, you're going to be getting uh problems even running it sometimes and certainly when you run it you may get spurious issues that you know the plant uh deployment environment is not going to have so you need to standardize your test environment so that the testers and the developers um and the production machine all have sort of comparable configurations exactly the same configuration so that you're confident if it works on my machine It'll work on the production machine. It'll work on the tester machine and vice versa. So this should all be the same. And uh, another need that comes up is, is resetting the state uh, after the test. Anyone want to say what that means? What do I mean by reset after the test? Yeah. That's right. Why do we do that? Excellent, uh, Larissa. Yeah, Larissa. Um, why would you? Why would you do that? Why is it so important that after the test we sort of clean out what it's changed? Because it can check whether tests are going on, yeah. or the actual system like might have hypothetically, if you have like databases, people's names, you want to get rid of the names for the. Good. Yeah, and and. Uh, you're absolutely right. So it affects our ability to reliably run tests and get reproducible results. Like if a test fails once, 
when we run it once. We don't want to be in a situation just because it altered things like in the database that if we run it again, it, will, it won't fail or vice versa, right? If then it runs fine the first time, but then it fails. We want to be able to set it up in a, in a controlled way. Sort of like a controlled experiment, like you might run it, you know, biology or chemistry or whatever. You want all the situation to be the same so that testers can reproduce it or, or developers can reproduce it. And so, you know, we, we want to reset the state following the test so we can be confident that if we run that test or other tests that they're run um, in a way they won't interfere with each other and it's completely reproducible. So, so that's a key need. And one of the, one of the technologies that's really achieved a lot of currency in this area um, is what's called uh, containerization. And there's a set of different containerization frameworks, uh, uh, Rocket, Docker, Singularity, or three. <clears throat> Docker is the, the dominant one these days. Um, and we talk about Dockerized environments and containerization uh, is captured through creation of, of Docker containers. And, and we create Docker images that describe the configuration we want to use precisely. And what it allows us to do is just essentially say there's a little micro world on our computer. And if you're on a Mac and I'm on a Windows box and someone else is on a Linux box, it, it doesn't matter. We have a, a kind of a virtual world inside that that's running exactly this version of Ubuntu. It's using exactly these libraries, this setup. Um, it has precisely the same environment down to the bits that it's accessing. And it's running inside a virtual container that may live on your machine while it's running, but it can't see things outside of what's what it's told about. So um, you can enable whether it can use the network or not. You can enable what files it can access. You can enable you know, what resources it can use. And containerization then allows that code to run in a totally standardized environment. And once that finishes running and you close down that container, <clears throat> other than anything it, it wrote out that you told it to write out externally, which is, uh, through very closely configured interfaces, it disappears and everything is reset. So every time you go back into the container, it starts in exactly the same state, precisely the same state, as if you had a fresh new install on that machine. So containerization is a way of precisely configuring in a machine readable way. You actually have a, a config file that says what, what, the, what the, the specification of the test environment is in a way you can distribute to other people and they can run it on totally different machines and know that they're gonna have precisely the same results, the same experiments. Um, so uh, containerization is not alone. Um, this should remind you of another technology that, that's more general. Um, this, this, what I described about containerization is any kind of a micro world that you know, thinks it's the world, but it's it's running within a bigger environment. Does that remind you of any other type of technology? Yeah, there is it. I'm guessing you're referring to Yeah, virtual machines and virtualization. Exactly. So these days, you know, we have boxes, right? Here that for a computer scientist, that's a box, right? But if, if the, the machines are boxes, and we use these terms to mean. Years. Um, um, and you want to be careful using that lingo around people like your stakeholders. You know, we'll get three boxes in place and you think you're talking about a pizza box or something, you know. Um, no, so a box, um, a box here is a computer, but often a given box is going to run multiple virtual machines, which might be spun up for certain needs and spun down for other needs. Um, so we might run on that same physical computers, three virtual machines that um, at different times are, are up or what have you. Or we might have virtual servers, which are each isolated from each other. And the common thing is they're isolated from one another. They're running in what they think is a complete machine, um, completely configured, 
but it's specified in software what the configuration is and you you spin them up when you need them and you can spin them down when you don't want to and one of the things i did there was to close down my virtual box which is another you know virtual machine i use to run windows under my Linux box so um containerization is part of that environment it's part of sort of the whole philosophy of virtualizing increasingly separating the vagaries of our physical hardware from from um, needing to have a, a precisely configured environment um, that can be used flexibly and even transferred between machines in some cases. Um, just a couple other uh, things, you know, you want to create a schedule for your testing. When are the testers going to get the code to, to run and release criteria is, is commonly used. So you may have certain criteria for when the incremental deliverable is ready for delivery. You know, you need no, you can have no more than one priority one bug or or zero priority one bugs and no more than two priority one, priority two bugs or what have you. Um, you might want to give that some thought. This class is time boxed, meaning you have to turn it in. Um, so release criteria haven't figured quite as prominently as they do in many areas of industry where they will govern when you turn it in. Uh, but you should consider um, having some release criteria, even for release to testers. Um, and uh, and then finally, you're going to want to derive some of your testing from your requirements. So at least you you have in place a good adoption of that V model. Okay, let's talk about this DevOps issue a little bit more. Um, so DevOps uh, is uh, a philosophy, set of practices, and and principles um, and, and processes associated with um, that bring together elements of software development with elements of, um, uh, of IT operations. Traditionally, in companies um, for decades, those have been handled by different groups. The people that did IT to configure the machines that were sitting on the desk of people at Facebook or Microsoft or Google and so a different set of people that were dealing with setting up the um, the actual products that they were shipping or or putting online as services, etc. It was a different group of people. The IT folks were kind of in the background just to serve the needs of the of the company, whereas the folks putting out software uh, as services or as products were were you know a a group that that the IT folks served. And that had a certain utility to it, but the model tended to break down in certain areas because often the developers have real infrastructural needs that weren't fully being met. And there are certain ways in which the IT staff um, would be needed to deliver on the developer's goals. And coming out of um, sort of a rethinking of that relationship was this DevOps development and operations joined um, uh, meshing that has caught the software world by storm. And I've listed some of its implications here, some of its um, emphasis here. You can go read more about it online and there's, there's tremendous amount of information and talks about it, et cetera. But as far as it impacts you, um, I'm emphasizing these seven things. So the use of continuous integration, we talked about that, right? What do I mean by continuous integration? What's one element of it? You see a uh, hand? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Name again? Uh, Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, having like a build pipeline. Yeah, it's a, a build pipeline's involved. Anytime you push, a build is kicked off. And when um so when people push code there's a set of build steps that will validate that code that will run a set of tests that's the component the second component continuous testing uh might run style checkers might run rebuilds in the database might run deployment scripts um and you know beyond that might involve a logging of information etc so this is um, this continuous integration supports people 
in contributing to the repo at any time, not just at the end of day or what have you, and having a whole validation script uh, set of scripts run that can lead other people to, to pull their code with confidence. The fact is, once it's contributed, you have high confidence about it. And so other people can get it and start building on it without the fear that they'll break, you know, they'll be got, getting broken code and that it will break the system. Uh, so this continuous testing is a big part of that commitment. It's not, but it's not the only thing. You're, you're, you're testing in the build at a very significant level. You're doing a smoke test for basic validation. And then often you're running some regression tests, uh, some basic uh, tests of, uh, at a unit test level and integration level and system test, just to be sure that it's operating correctly. Another component is release automation. So look, releasing to production, when I'm saying production, I mean, it's not just for testing, it's not just the developer trying it out, it's actually like the live version of the system. That shouldn't be an ad hoc test. That shouldn't be something that's like a one-off thing. Yeah, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go and execute this bunch of serious commands and get it there. That's um, fragile. If the right person is out one day, or if they, you know, they're distracted, and certain things um, are on their mind, they might not release it properly. You want to automate that so it's all a smooth process. You can push it out to the servers, the production servers, for example, in an automated way, and that can allow, you know, if you have a problem, re-releasing it quickly, etc. Another component that I emphasize to you is crash monitoring, but more generally performance monitoring. When I'm talking performance, I don't necessarily mean um, profile. If you had a profile in 370, 270, like running your code and having under a, a profiler um, will mean that you're running your code in an instrumented fashion. What do I mean by instrumented fashion? Anyone? Anyone? I'm checking the next conversation. Also, that means that you never seen like if there's any memory or anything like that. Exactly, and and uh, Shantu. Shantu. Um, that's exactly right. Um, so instrumentation basically runs your code, but with other hooks built in so that it's recording some information it normally doesn't record. Uh, how much memory it's using, how much time it's taking in different portions of it, for example, um, and potentially what files it's accessing and all that sort of stuff. And the reason we do that is because we want to know how big a footprint is it having like on the machine. And, uh, you know, are there certain parts of it that are really lagging performance wise, we have to speed up. Where are the bottlenecks? Bottlenecks in terms of time, you know, there might be 20% of the code that's taking 80% of the time. Or bottlenecks in terms of the memory footprint. You know, these, these couple areas are taking a huge amount of memory. Um, and we might be able to optimize that. And look, uh, many software developers love turning cold code. They love making their code the same by, you know, being really efficient. But the truth is, we don't know what to tune for a big system unless we we've uh, done performance instrumentation on it, unless we've done profiling on it. We don't know what to tune because we don't know what the bottlenecks are. We could spend a lot of time tuning parts of it that don't really make a difference. You know, it's half of a percent of the time is spent there and we make them wicked fast. I mean, what have we gained? But there may be certain parts that are in the, you know, have a lot of uh, use and which would take a lot of the, the, the execution time. And performance monitoring helps you understand the performance of your code, uh, the memory usage of your code, and know if it's no longer available because it crashed. And it'll feed you back information about these. So you, when it's running out there on testers boxes, or when it's running even in some users boxes, you have a sense of is it crashing? Is it working properly? So if you're publishing commercial apps, and, my, my shop is involved in a number of apps used you know, across the world uh, that have come out of our work. Um, and one of the most valuable things you can do is like look monthly, how many crashes did we have on this app? 
that we've gotten out there. How did they occur? What, you know, look at the crash report, you could see what libraries was it trying to use when it crashed? Um, oh, it was trying to do this encryption stuff on an older version of an iPhone. And you know, okay, you know, enough to reproduce it sometimes. So it was an iPhone six, you know, and it was it had this version of the encryption library on it or what have you, and it might let you reproduce it. Um, machine readable configuration setup uh, used to be in this course that the build master would spend a lot of time just manually configuring things from the command line, set things up and ready to go. And that was okay. As long as things went okay. I remember one year, um, watch out for this, it's a major risk if you're not careful. Uh, one of the teams set up their infrastructure for the class. Things were going great, but they weren't careful enough in one area, you know, one area of them. They weren't careful enough with the passwords that they were using. And guess what happened? Yes. So there was a, there were hackers that broke into their system. And they hacked in and basically they installed malware on their system. So they had to reinstall the whole thing. And that lost them some critical time in one of the incremental deliverables because they have to redo the whole manual configuration. You want your config information to be in your repo as a machine readable file so that you can reproduce it, right? So you, you have it right there. In case you need to reconfigure the machine, you don't have to go and type all these commands and and you know go get this, go download that. It, it should be all reproducible. That's part of DevOps. It's part of the operation side that traditionally someone else was doing for the developers, but you know should be part of that uh, that whole uh, culture of development. If if you're to really optimize uh, all aspects of it. Um, I talked about virtualization and containerization as, as a key, key element. That's a big part of DevOps, having in place um, total ability to reproduce exact environments that clean themselves up and that have precise specifications. And you'll go, if you go look at Docker, you'll find that it's exactly what it's designed to do. And in fact, you can use Docker images that specify your Docker environment. What environment you want your code to run on, you can use them on Rocket, you can use them on Singularity. So Docker is kind of at the hub of that ecosystem. And finally, and very importantly, attention to the user experience. Like to what degree are you meeting the needs of your users? Or to what degree are users, you know, shying away from certain areas of your program because it's too confusing? You want to get user feedback on your system on an ongoing basis. So you know about concerns early and you know about them often when they report them. Um, okay, a couple other suggestions in this front before we get into, um, into this issue of, of peer reviews. So um, something that teams in this class, you know, have issues with, but the truth is it's, it's one of those things that a lot of teams have issues with. Um, uh, more broadly, in software development, is skipping tests. The temptation to skip tests on late, late builds. This should says late checkups. What I mean is, um, and pushes that occur close to the deadline. So the idea here is low. We're running up against the deadline. We've got to get that incremental deliverable in by midnight, or you know, we got to ship this code. Um, whether it's an industry or in the class, the temptation there is, you know, get those bug fixes in to the last minute. And it's a nice, the idea said it's a nice city, you might think, to run tests. We don't have time for, for running the tests, you might think. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with saying, well, look, we don't have time to run the tests? What could happen? Yeah. Break more than just that one thing you're fixing. So, so that again? You can break more than yeah. That yeah, exactly. You fix one thing and and you broken another. Or maybe you thought you fixed it, but it was you just weren't creative enough and trying it, and actually it only fixed a small bit of the problem. This occurs everywhere, and it's especially 
it's so problematic. There's a thing, there's a term for it, the FFR. There's a thing called the fault feedback ratio. Um, ratio. Uh, and basically, what it, it asks is um, for all the bug fixes or defect fixes that you think you contributed, uh, what fraction of them actually introduced new problems? Or didn't fix the problem. You know, the problem still remains, or, or a new problem is, is still there. Anyone want to guess what this is? Like, like for for shipping software and development processes. Any, anyone want to guess? It's between zero and one. Um, if it were one, every time you fix something, you know, it's like one step forward, one step back. Every time you fix something, you break another thing. That that wouldn't get get very far. If it's zero, every time you fix something. It's one more thing off your list, and that's it. If, and you're making progress. Anyone want to guess what this is roughly in, in commercial software development processes? Yeah. Uh, so it can be actually most. Uh, it's not quite 0.75, but I think it's over 50% for larger changes. So, meaning if you're making changes that are on the order of a couple hundred lines, you're likely to introduce a new problem. If you're making changes that are like a couple of lines, uh, I think it's around 30%. Now, okay, you may say, well, you know, thank you very much for telling me that. What's the implication? To get back to Larissa's point, what's the implication of this for these late checkups? So if you go forward and you check this in, if you push it and you don't do testing on it, you skip the bill parts that are tested, testing it. Chances are is it is pretty good that there's another bug in there. And you know, it means it takes a lot longer sometimes to convert to the final product than it than you think, right? There's a lot of iteration. And later in the game, you know, each of those cycles where you you check it in and you go and you test it, and then you got to fix a new problem that kills you. The time to, to debug it. If there is a new problem, the time to debug it, the time to fix it, uh, it's going to cost more time. And then you got to check it in and test it again. And especially if the testing is not integrated into the build. You're going to be killed by it because you got to wait for the testers to be involved in testing it. You really want this testing going on immediately. Now that's still going to not going to take away from the fact you still have to fix it, right? Debug it. Okay, so you want to be very careful about this, and it's one of the reasons that mark my words. It's one of the reasons that products sometimes ship with bugs because they deliberately said, "Okay, that's the devil we know." Right? That's like, that's the problem we know about. We can put out a workaround request for it. We can document it. We can live with this. But if we, if we try to go fix it and it pops out, who knows where, it's going to take us a while to check the, to go chase those down. It's safer to stick with the one we know. This is good enough. And there's this notion of satisficing that uh, James Bach is, is famous for. Which basically says, look, um, it's what you're doing is is sufficient. You're sacrificing some things, but what you're doing is sufficient for for um, a satisfied customer, and you're reducing the risk that will come from continuing to iterate. You're getting it to them in a time frame that's satisfactory to them. You're sacrificing some things. You didn't get everything, but it's enough to make them happy. Um, Okay, you should be planning for some non-functional tests. This gets a little bit to what Trump Thun was saying with, you know, stress testing and load testing, performance tests, um, uh, you know, testing things like with memory footprint, et cetera. So doing some tests of the load of your code in the system and it's how much memory it's taking and how long it takes to run. Um, uh, okay, um, 
and and this is sort of isolation of of, of testing in, in development environment you're going to want to use the standardized configuration that's isolated in the sense that it's not tied up with configuration issues that are separate between them, for example. Um, you want testers to be involved in some exploratory testing. Good testing is can be put into scripts a lot of the time, but there's a need to, to try to find new bugs. Um, exploratory tests are really helpful. Good testers can follow their nose. I say, oh, this area of the system is kind of soft. You know, I noticed some weird things when we tried to do that. Um, you know, it was really slow or it didn't refresh properly or it had this problem when I was disconnected or what have you. Um, it, it, uh, it didn't work uh, because of using too much memory. And they go and they try these things and good testers follow their nose and can often you know, a zero in on some some bugs or some real problems associated with it. They they push it further. They notice it takes you a while. They give it something more complex. And they they keep on pushing it to see if they can get it to to really um, take a huge amount of uh, of load or a huge amount of memory, et cetera, and, and document it. Um, regression tests things that for bugs you've already fixed, put them in the automated test suite so that you know, you keep on looking for them because if they reemerge, you want to know as soon as possible. So something that starts as a manual test, something someone does, click, 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 you know, by hand, uh, or that they find through exploratory testing is a problem in report, it should make its way to an automated test that's used, um, and once it's fixed, it should be used for regression. Um, you should be using test tools. There's this whole universe of testing tools out there. Developers are often not so aware of them. Testing is its own art. It's its own, um, its own world in terms of the tools, in terms of the techniques. And testers get really good at it. And I want you folks on the testing teams to get good at it. And then I talked about uh, code freezes. Okay, I, I just want to introduce some terminology here before we go on uh, in our final 20 minutes to, to issues of peer review. Um, so conceptually, um, their development takes place in stages and more to the point, issues with the project go through various stages and defects go through these stages. Um, some of these stages are not so visible, uh, some are very visible. And I wanna distinguish between them because we have certain terminology we use. So you have to be aware that if you have a defect uh, issue tracking system that lists a certain number of defects to your system, you're going to be very lucky if that's all the defects. Why do I say that? Why do I say you're very lucky? If, if you have a list of 100 defects, why do I say you're very lucky if that's all the defects? You're going to like lots of defects. Yeah. You know, you know the, the, the set that you're dealing with in terms of quality problems. Often the bigger issue is what you don't know, right? It's the things you don't know that can sometimes kill you. Those things you know, you can assess them and you say, how bad a shape are we in? How long will it take us to fix these? You know, how serious are they? And you can triage them. You can, you can deal with the ones that are most important and defer the other ones. Um, or warn against them, put out workarounds, what have you. It's the undiagnosed ones that are often the biggest problems. And almost all defects originally start like undiagnosed. That's why I draw them in this, this first box here. Now, through testing, whether it's formal or informal, whether it's manual or automated, we, we arrive at bug reports for defects. These are uh, system trouble incidents. We actually don't. The issue is an issue tracker is a much better term than a bug tracker. We typically don't directly observe the bug. What we observe is a failure that occurs because of some underlying fault that we don't directly observe yet. Testing finds the failure. It says, oh, this thing cracked. 
That thing never terminated. This thing gave the wrong answer. Uh, and those things, you know, get enshrined in bug reports, but that's a misnomer. They should be enshrined in what we might call system trouble incidents, for example, um, uh, or issues that are found. Now, in this, in this list, which is an explicit list, um, there may be many duplicates. There may be things that are based on misunderstanding. You know, someone said this gave the wrong answer, but maybe they were wrong. It, it, it actually gave the right answer. They just hadn't, hadn't realized it. Maybe they misunderstood what it was supposed to do or, or were dealing with an old specification. Um, it also may include a lot of duplicates or things that are outdated, et cetera. Um, and we go through a process called sanitization with, where basically we take those reports and we actually wait through them and figure out, okay, which of these are real, unique, you know, current, meaning the, the current version of the system, um, not outdated, not based on misunderstandings, not so incomplete, you can't really see if there's an issue. Maybe someone's reporting something from a version of Android that it wasn't supposed to work on, you know, and and you basically ignore those things, and you 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 uh, you, you basically say, okay, what are the real active bugs? So you promote them. Sanitization identifies active bugs. Those are the active defects or the active issues to work on. To say bugs is again a misnomer. Um, these are the active ones, and then a process of triage. You figure out, okay, which are really the important ones. Like, which are the ones we want to focus our time on? Maybe there are some that are kind of nice cities. Yeah, we'll get around to it. This one can be fixed anyway because we're overhauling that part of the system. Let's not put our effort into fixing it uh, until the new version of the system, that, that component of the system finishes. Um, or, oh, yeah, we know about it. The system doesn't work well when it's disconnected from the web in this way. We know about that. We can live with that. And we'll just warn people or what have you. Um, so triage basically determines a set of important bugs. And then those are you know, assigned to various developers, either self-assigned or, or assigned by the dev manager. And then there's going to be having assigned those to developers and they produce fixes, there's going to be a set that are believed fixed by the developers. So the developer worked on it and they say, I think I fixed that. Notice I emphasize believed. Uh, here. Why might those not actually be fixed? Why, why they might, might it be that they're merely believed to be fixed, but not in fact fixed? Anyone? Yeah, Marissa. The reasons before, like not early tested enough, or for some cases, not. Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes the developer um, is eager to prove their code is right. There's some problem with developer testing. We like, as developers, we often like to show our code works. So we have sympathetic testing. We test our code to show that it works. And that's a problem because the world is not interested in showing that our code works. Uh, and this is one of the reasons testers are a good complement to developers because their goal is not to show that the code works. <laughs> testers often like to to show that they can make the code break. And it's a great compliment. But sometimes it leads to some acrimony. Sometimes it leads to some tension between developers and testers. Because the testers want to flaunt, you know, like, uh, I shouldn't say they want to flaunt. They want to say, look, I, you know, the code broke. And the developers want to say, my code is good. You know, what are you telling me? It's bad code, you know. Um, uh, and, and there's some acrimony there. So developers sometimes, often they have a more sympathetic view to, to the, the fact that their code works and they like to believe that things are fixed that aren't really. And so quite a few of these that are believed fixed contribute to this fault feedback ratio. And, and you know, they end up being identified quickly by the tester. Sorry, that isn't fixed. It still happens. Um, now, some of these, the reporter, often a tester, sometimes a user, says, okay, it's now fixed. And, and that goes to what's called resolved. 
And so it's a result bug, but it's not yet closed. And the test team genuinely, uh, so often the test team sign off is needed to promote it from resolved to closed. And that's like, okay, it's a past issue. Should still be included in regression tests, typically, et cetera make sure it doesn't come up again, but it's basically no longer, you know, something of, of active interest to the test team. So bear this in mind um, that we have these, um, this kind of stage of a bug's life or a defect's life. And one of the things I want to emphasize, say it now, say it again later, and I'll test you on the final exam, is, uh, you know, testing, finds failures. There's a process by which we find the problem underlying the failure, the defect underlying the failure that's called what? What is going from a failure, an observation of a failure, to, to understanding of the cause from? That's called what? Common word. Begins with D. Debugging. debugging. So debugging process. That takes a lot of time. And debugging is needed you know, in order to fix this, right? And you notice that this is a very test center sort of picture here that I was identifying, but it, it bears noting that peer review, the next topic I'm gonna to talk about right now, directly burrows down to identify faults and not failure. It cuts through all the details to directly look looking at code say there's a problem here let's identify the underlying fault from the start and it cuts out the need for the debugging side it cuts out the need for you know running a lot of tests by allowing it to zero in on the problem and for that i'm going to go to peer reviews which is the major uh, major goal here so reviews um partly in light of what i just said uh Form a, a key part of the industry. Um, and, you know, there's been huge realization since the 80s when peer review processes first achieved a great deal of prominence uh, within software development. I remember being part of that. Um, that peer reviews have, have been recognized now as actually more cost effective than testing. You actually find bugs more efficiently, defects more efficiently than through testing and then debugging. Because you find, you go to the heart of the issue by, by spotting the faults. And it turns out they find a greater, a greater fraction of the defects than does testing. Testing can find a large number of defects, but it's hard to test certain types of things. It's hard to get the system into the state to test it. It's hard to reproduce it or what have you. Whereas it turns out peer reviews actually test a, a, a broader set. They really pay for themselves. Like they take time. Get together the team for formal inspection or whatever it takes time. But it turns out they easily pay for themselves by offloading the team from testing and, and uh, debugging time and, and the time to sort of try to fix something and then it, it, it doesn't work and you, you iterate on it and all that. Um, and they're more flexible than testing. The amazing thing is you don't even have to wait for the executable code. You, you, can, you can do peer review on requirements documents. You can do peer review on, on you know, uh, plan for the structure of the deliverable. You can do peer reviews on high level design documents. You can do peer review on a testing plan. Um, you can do peer review on tests. There's all sorts of things you can do peer review on that don't directly involve executable code. You know, you can do it on a manual testing plan. And therefore, you can get started on it soon. Like, uh, yeah, you um, should be thinking about that. Um, and, you know, you can also, in the peer review, address other issues that testing doesn't find, like the clarity of the code, the commenting, the degree to which it's, it's, uh, it adheres to good code practices, uh, stylistic conventions, et cetera. So early reviews, you should be thinking about this, like UI design for the system. Review it. Do, a, do an inspection on it. Requirements documents. 
um, design documents I mentioned, um, testing plans or another, you know, what sort of tests do we need that would develop confidence this system is working, whether at a, a unit level or at a, a level of system tests. Um, you could start thinking about this now. Right now, you could be thinking about the unit test for your, you know, uh, plate wave study interface or your your uh, your app. You could start thinking about what might some of the tests be for an app for for missing children. Um, so, uh, you know, early artifacts have disproportionate impact on development and its success, and you could get going with those sooner. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to lots of people, to the person reviewing the artifact. Peer reviews spread knowledge. Why do I say they spread knowledge? Yeah, where is it? Um, it helps you learn what other people are doing and other tasks going through their problems. Exactly. So if they're sick, at least you know something about how that code works. If they move on to another job, they go to class. You know, you know, basically about how this subsystem works. You can explain it to other people often. And sometimes you learn coding trick from them, stylistic ideas, and you learn about like, oh, is that how just based testing works in React Native? Or is that how you know progressive web apps handle this issue of a disconnection from the web or what have you, or persistence of data even when you're disconnected from the web? Um it also helps the person whose artifact is being reviewed. I mean, it helps them improve their techniques, learn from others, recognize vulnerabilities, right? Maybe the people, maybe their code uses these other pieces of code, and those people who wrote those are in peer review. And so they could say, well, you know, you should really be doing this when you call my function. Um, you should be, you should be, you know, passing at this instead. That isn't how you're supposed to use it. Right. Um, and it look, it spreads knowledge throughout an organization, not only about the code base, but about standards, coding styles, etc. And it helps improve the clarity of your code. Because people could say, look, it looks like it works, but I don't understand what it's doing. You need to clean it up, you need to refactor it, you need to put it into a couple different, you know, modules or, or functions or what have you. Um, so there's many parts for peer review. This is from this great book by Carl Wiegers on uh, peer reviews and software that I strongly recommend. Um, there's a couple of books in that area that I think I refer to in the syllabus. Um, okay, so guidelines for reviewers. It's, it's really important that peer reviews be kept in person. The goal of a peer review is not to review a peer. Let me reiterate that. The goal of a peer review is not to review a peer. It's not to say, you know, your coding style is lousy. Um, it's instead to have review by peers of a technical artifact. What I mean by that is it's, it's asking your peers to help look over this piece of test, testing code that you wrote this uh, test plan, this requirements document, this uh, bit of code for this part of the system, um, and, and get their thoughts for how you can improve it. Um, how can we do even better? That's the right way to look at it. It's not, you know, why is this lousy? Why is it broken? It's how can we, how can we do better with this? Uh, how can I improve it? Um, and how can I use these other components of the system better? How can I make it more clear? How can I make it less confusing, et cetera? You should keep the peer review team small. I mean, it should be, you know, no more than, than seven, certainly. And, and often it's uh, three or four participants for more informal reviews. And one for things like peer programming and peer desk check, et cetera. Um, and generally you try to identify but not solve problems in the review. They're trying to help you know, figure out, okay, how could this be improved by identifying this or identifying that without trying to come up with a complete solution? Um, it shouldn't be, you know, a marathon thing, just, you know, no more than two hours. And for certain types of formal reviews, you're going to have advanced preparation. That really, that really helps a lot. Um, and, um, you know, you're going to want to prioritize your focus on certain things. Okay, so, you know, generally we can put, 
reviews on a spectrum. And as we'll see, it actually is multidimensional. It's not just one line, but but um, here I've, I've simplified it to one line between most formal reviews and least formal. And you can see there's different types of reviews in each stage. I've asked you to perform inspections, but the truth is I'm not asking you to, to religiously adhere to all components. So some of your stuff is more like a team, team review. By contrast, way over here, there's things that are, are more ad hoc, uh, just checking in on something. Could you take a look at this? That are way down at the other side. And there's some differences in terms used elsewhere. Let's talk about their characteristics. Okay. A review type is shown here on the sort of vertical axis. And then there's the types of activities that take place or not for that review type. And once again, you see the same kind of continuum here on the y axis that we saw here. We just sort of took this and we, we, we turn it on its side, right? Um, so here are inspections. Um, and here are the simplest type of reviews. So ad hoc reviews, you might have a meeting and there might be some correction that you, you get them to look at, but there's no advanced preparation. There's no planning for it. There's no subsequent verification, but you try to arrive at, 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 a, uh, at, a, at a correction, let's say. Um, for uh, a peer desk check, you might ask them ahead of time, hey, could you look at this? Let's get together and talk about it. Um, you might have a meeting with them or not. They might make, make comments in that remotely via email. And you know they, they might be involved in the, uh, the fixing process. Pair programming, you know, you're, you're getting together, you're planning, okay, we're, let's, let's pair program it for these two hours. Um, there's no preparation involved. Uh, there's a continuous meeting. And you know you're you're putting in place fixes while you're there, et cetera. And you go all the way through inspections where you're planning ahead, you have preparation, there is a meeting. Often there's some follow-up outside of the review. There's someone who takes charge of sort of serving as post-review, double just double checking things and a verification step. But I'm sort of collapsing uh, correction and verification. Um Okay, so here um, you, I'm going to distinguish between what's, what's expected of you for an inspection versus uh, more informal things. For an inspection, what I'm looking for in this class um, and what's generally um, you know, advised is you should have in place someone who presents the code. Now, in a walkthrough, it can be the author Generally, for an inspection, it's someone other than the author who's present. And it helps keep it more impersonal and it helps the author be less caught up in, in sort of worrying about the presentation and to more look on it um, analytically or, or in a more cognitive way. I'm not going to require that. If you want to have the author present, I'm actually okay with that. Okay. And, and that's fine. But there should be a separate leader who serves as kind of the moderator or the MC, the person who just makes sure that um, things are, are coming along with it and, uh, and the overall plan for the review is being followed, et cetera. And generally that's not the author is what I'm looking for. It shouldn't just be the author. Um, you know, for an inspection, generally it's smaller chunks of material, no more than a couple hundred lines. There should be a recorder, someone else who's writing things down so the author is not getting caught up in it. And the people commenting don't have to go through it. There should be someone else. And often they will end up um, uh, keeping track of time too. So just making sure time is, you know, we're making progress within the time frame um, that we need to. Um, and there's particularly participant roles uh, here. You know, I'm here as a reader. And often I'll have like two, two readers, two or three readers. So I have a couple people commenting on the code, um, and I'm the author there, and maybe there's the uh, the moderator who's who's leading it, and a recorder who's taking things down. Um, and you know, generally coming out of a review, there's a checklist for things that are found. This is key. You should be in a review coming up with a list of items found. Often you put, you know, where they were found in the system and, and you know, who reported them so you can go back and, 
and talk about them. Um, maybe some some issues of the type of thing that they were, you know, confusion about this, uh, uh, outdated commenting or whatever, the type of, of issue that was brought up. So I'd like you to just bear this in mind. I'm not going to ask for like incredibly tight adherence to this, but I would like you to aspire to a sensible combination of how to make use of this approach. And if you want to innovate around it, I'm fine. But please do have you know a leader. Please do have someone recording. Please do have more than one commenter, and uh, and you should have someone you know presenting the material. And there should be ahead of time on um, circulation of material, if at all possible. So, you know, ahead of time preparation, there should be some circulation material. So send out the code to be reviewed, not, you know, not, not 30 seconds before the review starts or after the review for well ahead of time. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, uh, I, I am providing some slides on, you know, best practices for inspections. Um, and uh, and you know good people to include in a review who include like those who if you're reviewing code that depends on other things those people are good to have there or if there's other people who use the code being reviewed as by calling it or whatever those people should be there ideally so that they know how to use it so think about who's invited it shouldn't just be any random people ideally it should be the people who are depending on the code or are dependent on by the code or the tests or what have you. Um, okay, that's all we'll leave it. Um, so, uh, remind you, I do have office hours Tuesday, Thursday, and I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing anyone in office hours after class if you'd like to come Thank you very much.